Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? He is risen. Yes, amen. Welcome to those of you who are also joining us online. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. And so if you have a Bible again with you, we're going to be in Mark 16, looking at verses 1 through 8. So I don't know about you, but there are times when I have a craving for a really good grilled cheese sandwich. Anybody with me on that? Yeah, I mean, if you've ever seen the movie The Chef with John Fav. Fevra, I think is how you say his last time. He's got, the, there's this um, scene where he's cooking his son a grilled cheese and he's buttering the bread and he's stacking up the cheese and he's putting it on the griddle and then he's putting it together. By the time he gives it to his son, it's just like ooey, gooey, crispy mess. The cheese is spilling out. And you're just like, yes, I would love one of those. Well, these two guys named Corey and True also desired good grilled cheese sandwiches, and so they decided to open up a grilled cheese sandwich shop called Tom and Chi. It started, uh, you know, around 2011 or so in Cincinnati, and they started it under a tent in a park. And somewhere along the way, they found themselves on Shark Tank in 2013, going before the Shark Tank investors, and one of them wanted to invest money in their shop, and so they started opening up stores all over the place. Around 2015, 2016, they had like 35 stores all across the country. So one day, Craig and I, this was like 2016, Craig and I are talking about grilled cheese sandwiches, right, as you do at a church office. <laughs> and we started talking about Tom and Chi because there was one in Elm Grove, there was one in Brookfield, and we're like, we need to go. Now their signature sandwich was a donut grilled cheese. They take a donut, cut it in half, grill it up, and like, oh, it's like sweet and salty, ooey gooey. And they had complimentary soft serve, right? So you could just go get as much soft serve as you wanted while you eat your grilled cheese. So we were dreaming about soft serve and grilled cheese donuts. And we are on our way to Brookfield, talking about it the whole way, getting super excited. We pull into the parking lot. We walk up to the door. We go to open the door. And as we peek inside, everything looks a little weird. The lights are off. And like we notice it's locked and we step back and like the sign is gone and they had closed the store. Like we were expecting the store to be there. We had got so excited about it, but yet it was completely gone. Turns out the infrastructure of Tom and Chi was not able to sustain 35 stores. So just after a few years of opening all of them, they started to drastically close them. And we found ourselves so disappointed ended up going to Chick-fil-A instead for lunch, which is not a, not a bad second, right? But I wonder if you've ever had a moment like that, where you were expecting something to happen, and it didn't. Or you were expecting someone or something to be in a certain place, and it wasn't. Or you were expecting, you know, you set something down, you step away, you're expecting it to be there when you get back, and it's gone. Like those moments have this way of disrupting our lives a little bit and make us wonder, like, did I miss something? Like, did I lose something? Did I forget something? Like, something doesn't seem quite right about this moment. When you expect something or someone to be in a certain place, and they're just not there. Well, well believe it or not, the Easter story, the first Easter morning, starts kind of like that. It starts with three women going to look for someone who is not where they expected him to be. This is how Mark 16, verse 1 through 8 begins. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. So at the beginning of this passage, we're introduced to three women. A woman named Mary Magdalene, who has known Jesus for a while. He actually healed her. He restored her. She was said to be possessed by demons, and he got them out of her. And she became a follower of his. We're met by another woman named Mary. Mary, who is said to be the mother of James. Could have been James, one of the disciples of Jesus. And a woman named Salome. And we're told in John, uh, excuse me, Mark 15 that these three women were dedicated followers of Jesus. And they would have traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which would have been about 70 miles, would have been a few days' journey. And they were completely devoted to who he was, what he was about, and what he said he was doing with God's kingdom. And we're also told that these three women were there at the cross when Jesus died. 
They saw Jesus breathe his last breath. They saw life go out from him and his lifeless body hanging on the cross. They also saw two men take Jesus down from the cross and put him in a tomb so they knew where his body was supposed to be. Now, Jesus died on a Friday, which in Jewish tradition, that was known as the day of preparation. Friday was the day where they would prepare for the Sabbath, which was a day of rest, which was Saturday. And in Jewish law, you were supposed to do no work, exert no physical exertion on the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath started on Friday at sundown and would go until Saturday at sundown. And so Jesus dies in the late afternoon on Friday. And these Jews, being good Jews who want to honor the Sabbath, probably hastily bury Jesus because the Sabbath is coming. And they don't want to leave Jesus out on the cross for the Sabbath, have his body exposed for a full day and a half. They want to honor his body. They want to dignify him. And so they probably quickly bury him. And so what we're told here is that it's now the day after the Sabbath. And these three women are going to the tomb with spices, probably to finish the burial process, probably to honor Jesus and dignify him as he is now gone from them. And they're out early on the morning on that Sunday. And this is what we read, verse 2. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, They were on their way to the tomb. Now, I don't know about you, but early morning is one of my favorite times of the day. When the early morning comes, there's so much possibility. There's so much potential to what the day could hold. No matter what yesterday was like, today you get a new day. You get a fresh start. You get a new chance on what the day could bring. The early morning, unless you have young kids, comes at you with calm and peace, and quiet, right? And if you're lucky and you're up early enough, you can even see a sunrise. So there's two mornings a week that I usually go for a run with a good friend in my neighborhood, and one of our usual routes is we go south on 76th Street, go by the the middle school, and go by Lincoln Elementary School, and then we take a left going east on Hillcrest Drive. And as you go left and east on Hillcrest Drive, you start to go up a hill, hence the title Hillcrest for the road. And we go to the the entrance of the highlands. And one day we're running and we can see the crest of the top of the hill. And there's this little sliver of color. And usually I like I'm huffing and puffing and dying and wanting to sit down. But I see this little sliver of color and I get energized because I know, oh, there's a sunrise that's worth seeing. And so we climb to the top of the hill, kind of give ourselves a little kick, and we go and we get to the top and there's this beautiful sunrise. And pictures never do it justice, right? But it's just like, oh, and we stop and I'm like, I have to take a picture of this. Like the sky is filling with purples and pinks and oranges. It's just like, oh, you're, you're there in the morning and it's calm. It's like the world hasn't woken up yet and you're just like, ah, oh, peace. Now, I wonder if the women going to the tomb that morning would have experienced a similar sort of morning. And if so, it would have been a really interesting juxtaposition to the grief that they would have been experiencing. Like waking up, the cool of the morning, the sun is starting to come up, the world isn't yet up and at them, and they're just like, oh, the peace of the morning. But yet, they're experiencing this incredible anguish and sorrow because their leader, Jesus, the one that they traveled to Jerusalem with to celebrate the Passover, has died and he's buried in this tomb. I mean, just a week prior, they watched him ride into Jerusalem with the crowd shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, the King, the Savior, the Messiah has come. He is here. Seven days later, he's now buried in a tomb. And they're probably thinking to themselves, what in the world happened? And I think that's a really good word picture for the world we live in. Meaning we live in a world that's full of beauty, that's full of peace, wonderful moments, but it's also riddled with pain and sorrow and grief. And somehow those two things constantly collide. And sometimes we find ourselves sitting in the tension of those moments. You know, right before first service, we had a woman who came in who was away for this past week caring for a friend of hers who has just gone through cancer 
and surgery to remove cancer. And with tears in her eyes, she's like, she doesn't have much longer. And she's here on Easter morning where we're celebrating the resurrection. It's like she's sitting in this place of tension of like, I've just come from watching my friend get a few days closer to her death while at the same time coming to be with my church family to celebrate. It's this weird mix of pain and beauty, grief and peace. We live in a world where those two things exist. And what these women on this first Easter morning have in front of them is an insurmountable challenge that they probably knew was coming, but at some level didn't expect. We read this in verse 3. As they went to the tomb, they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? And I don't know if this is what happened, but I imagine they probably are just, again, so overcome with grief. They've got all these spices together. They've made these preparations to go anoint Jesus' body, and they've forgotten one minor detail that has major implications for them doing what they set out to do. And that's the big stone. How are we going to move this stone? Maybe even accentuating their grief that they are experiencing as they get closer to this tomb. But then in verse 4, we read this. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Which probably incites all sort of curiosity from them. Like, what, like what is going on here? I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments where you go home midday and you expect no one else to be in your house. But as you come up to the door, like the door is open, it's unlocked, you see some lights on, you can tell somebody's home and you're like, what is going on here? Like, you've ever had one of those moments before? Now, if you're married, the logical conclusion is, well, it's probably my spouse, right? If you live with roommates, the logical conclusion is like, well, it's probably the people I live with, right? But even still, when you're not expecting someone to be home and they are home, you kind of walk in with a little heightened awareness, right? Your senses are up and you're like, what is going on here? Well, I imagine these women entered into the tomb with that mindset, like we were expecting the stone to be covering the tomb. We were expecting Jesus' body to be in there, but now the stone is rolled away, and this is what we see, they see on the inside of the tomb. This is verse 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed. He said, you were looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, if you're following along in your own Bible or have some sort of copy of the Scriptures in front of you, you probably see at this point in the text a line or some sort of bracketed like instruction or description that says the following verses, right? Because Mark 16 actually goes from verse 9 through to verse 20. There's another 12 verses. But it says there oftentimes in different copies of the scripture that verse 9 through 20 wasn't in the earliest manuscripts of Mark's gospel, which means they were added later. And they were either added because Mark's gospel, the, the original ending to Mark's gospel was lost, or maybe somebody just didn't like the way Mark ended it, and so they added another one. Or it could be that Mark intentionally ends his gospel in verse 8, which would be kind of an interesting way to end the story of Jesus, right? Verse 8 again, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End of story. Which would be a real interesting way to end the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. These women running away from the tomb, trembling and afraid. Now, I like to think that Mark was intentional in leaving it that way, kind of leaving a cliffhanger. Because if you ever watched a movie that has this major plot twist at the end, and you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. 
I didn't think it was going to end that way. And then what do you have to do? You have to go back and watch the movie all over again to see if there were different clues along the way to like, oh, that, that was cluing me to this. So maybe Mark actually had some intentionality in finishing his gospel in this way. Some people even speculate that he intentionally finishes it this way to highlight the mystery of the resurrection. Now, I don't know exactly if there was an ending that was lost or if Mark intentionally ends this way. I like to think that he did. But this moment highlights three reactions, three responses from these women in this moment. Those three reactions are one, grief, two, confusion, and three, fear. We're not explicitly told that they are grieving, but it's a logical conclusion. That their leader, their king, their Messiah has just died, and they were hoping he was going to change the world, and now he's gone. So naturally, they would be grieving. There's obviously confusion as they walk into the tomb. It says that they were alarmed. The angel has to tell them, don't be alarmed. And they're like, what in the world is going on? It says that they leave bewildered, trying to make sense of what they've just witnessed. And then there's fear. They leave trembling and afraid. They have no category for what they're experiencing. They thought Jesus' body was going to be in the tomb, buried and dead, but instead, apparently, he's on the loose. (laughs) And so, these three things surface for these women. Grief, confusion, and fear. And our world is full of those things. And I don't know if you're here this morning and you're sitting in some of that. But my guess is, if you're not in that place right now, you've been in that place before. The fear, confusion, and grief. Or you know that it's coming. You live a long enough life and you come to realize that, yes, our world is filled with those things. Life is hard and it comes with sadness. Life is difficult and it comes with chaos and confusion. It can be really scary. It can fill us full up with fear. I remember a handful of years ago serving another church before we were here. It was a Wednesday morning and I had a breakfast meeting with two of the elders who were serving at our church. We had some unfinished business from the, meet, the elder meeting we had earlier in that week. So we go to meet for breakfast. We're sitting down at this bagel shop. We order our food. We do the business we need to do. And then before these guys have to get off on start their day, we have about 10, 15 minutes. And we're just talking about life, talking about what's, finishing, what's coming up in our weeks to finish out our week. And one guy, his name was Rutledge, he was talking about this minor surgical procedure that he was supposed to have the next day. So we started asking, like, hey, how you feeling about it? You nervous? You scared? He's like, no, it's not that big a deal. I should be in and out, right? In one day, no big deal. And so we said we pray for him, we pray for him, we all go about our day. He goes to surgery the next day. The day goes. By the end of the day, we all get an email saying that there was complications with the procedure. A minor procedure. He's supposed to be in and out. They sedated him, put him under, but they couldn't bring him back out of the anesthesia. There was something with his breathing that wasn't working. So over the weekend, we gathered, we prayed, we went to the hospital. I remember walking into his hospital room, seeing him all connected to machines and tubes, watching a machine breathe for him, and just praying for him, talking to him. They say, hey, he probably can still hear you, so I'm just saying some words to him, reading scripture to him, praying over him, and then we leave. All next week, it was this back and forth, touch and go, and he ended up passing. What was supposed to be a minor surgical procedure took his life. And I can remember sitting in the living room with his now widowed wife, full of confusion. Like, why did this happen? I mean, it wasn't supposed to end that way. It was a minor surgical procedure, full up with grief. Like, this guy was just, you know, a kind of this firm rock cornerstone of the faith, an example to so many. Like, why would God take him? And there's all sorts of fear that she was living with. Like, what is my life going to be like now without my husband? And we all face moments like that. We all face the unexpected tragedy, and it brings confusion, fear, and grief. And these women are sitting in it. And what they don't necessarily realize as they're fleeing from the tomb is that the resurrection of Jesus brings 
comfort in our grief. It brings comfort to our grief. Because even in the most painful of circumstances, even in the face of death, the resurrection brings comfort in our grief because the resurrection says death doesn't have the last word. Death doesn't win in the end. There is one who is stronger than death. There is one who has defeated death and conquered the grave. His name is Jesus. And they don't fully get it at that moment. But it brings comfort in their grief. It also brings clarity to our confusion. Not to say that like you're never going to be confused because of the resurrection, but the resurrection tells us that history is headed somewhere. There's a trajectory on which our world is headed where Jesus will one day return and he will make all things new. He will make all things right. So even in the here and now, when I don't know what's left, what's right, what's up, what's down, when I feel turned around and backwards and life doesn't make sense, we have hope that when Jesus comes back, he will wipe away every tear from every eye. There will be no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. Death will be swallowed up fully in the victory of Jesus. And so therefore we have hope and we have clarity that this world is headed somewhere. And so even when I can't see clearly, I can count on Jesus to get me through. And it brings, lastly, courage to our fear. We can face hard things because we know that death doesn't win. We can face hard things because we know that Jesus will give us clarity in the midst of the confusing chaos of life. And as you go back and you read through all of Jesus' story in the Gospels, you see he's constantly doing those things. He's bringing comfort to those who are in grief. He's bringing clarity to those who don't know what to do. He's bringing courage to those saying, as Nate said earlier, don't be afraid. Everything is going to be fine. But the question is, how? Like, how do we appropriate courage, clarity, and comfort in our lives in the midst of difficult things? I think the answer is through faith. Through faith. Through trusting that what Jesus has done is true reality. And sometimes it's been said of faith that faith grows in the dark. Faith grows in the dark places of our life. Faith grows in those painful places. It grows in those deep heartache moments. It grows in the anguish. Because sometimes in the dark places, it's the glimmer of light that shines brightest. A couple weeks ago for spring break, our family was in the mountains of North Carolina. We had some friends who have a house on the top of a mountain, and they invited us for the week, so naturally we went. And there was one night where we were just standing out in the front yard, and we looked up at the sky, and you could see stars everywhere. I mean, we sat out there for 10 minutes just trying to pick out constellations. We pulled out apps that help you find constellations. I mean, these stars were beautiful and bright, now, when you're in the city, sometimes because of all the extra light in the city, it's hard to see the stars. So what you have to do is you have to get to the darker places, and then you can see the stars. It's not as though they appear and they weren't there before. They're always there, but sometimes it's being in those extra dark places that help you see the light more clearly. And so sometimes for us, when we're in those dark places of life, where life doesn't make sense, when life feels depressing and discouraging. It's in those moments that Jesus shines most brightly, reminding us that he has always been there. And it's the resurrection that reminds us that even in the darkest places of life, there's hope and there's light. And so the question is, what are you putting your faith in? Because sometimes we have this misperception, well, some people have faith and other people don't. But I would say that's not the case at all. Everyone has faith. The question is, what is the object of your faith? What is the thing that you put your confidence in when life feels like it's upside down? What is the thing that you look to give you security when you feel insecure? What is the thing you look to to give you clarity when life seems chaotic and confusing? Whatever that knee-jerk thing is you go to, that's the object of your faith. You do have faith and confidence in something. The question is, what is it? Is it Jesus? 
and his good news and his kingdom and the message of his resurrection or something else? What is the object of your faith? And so for us who are followers of Jesus, we put our faith in his death and his resurrection because we believe that he has started the process through his resurrection of making all things new and he will complete that when he returns. And the other thing we put our faith in is his words because his words are simply an extension of him. And that's what the angel says to these women when they're standing in this empty tomb looking for Jesus and he's not there. Let's go back and read verse 6 and 7 again. The angel says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Notice this last part. Just as he told you. Jesus wasn't caught off guard. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He even told the disciples multiple times, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. They are going to crucify me. Three days later, I am going to rise again. I will see you again in Galilee. So we have confidence in his word because his word is true. His word is steadfast. His word is strong. His word is reliable. His word is an extension of him. And so we put our confidence in his death, in his resurrection, in his life, in his word, trusting that like he said, behold, I'm coming back. He has gone to the Father, but he is coming back to fully make all things new. And we put our hope in that because he said it, and we can trust that he will come through with what he said he's going to do. The woman who lost her husband after that minor surgical procedure, her name was Ida. And a few months after her husband passed, I was talking to her one Sunday at our church, and just gave her a hug and I said, hey, Ida, how you holding up? And, you know, she said she was, you know, working through her grief and working through all sorts of other emotions. But she said, if there's one thing I could tell young people today in their 20s and 30s is continue to read the Word of God. Continue to put yourself in the Scriptures because when you hit hard times in life, it will be there for you in ways you could never imagine. She said, I'm calling all things to mind. Like, there's so many things I'm remembering. God is just like making his scriptures come alive in this season of sorrow for me. And if I hadn't spent time in the word, it wouldn't be in me already. She's like, I'm putting my confidence, greater confidence in his word because it's continuing to nourish me, comfort me, give me confidence and courage and clarity in the midst of this chaos. And so in this moment, in Mark 8. Like, these women haven't fully grasped the reality of what's happened. They they will soon, but they haven't fully grasped it yet. And I like to believe that, again, Mark was intentional in ending his gospel this way, because it leaves kind of a cliffhanger. Like, how will they respond? Will they go and do what the angel says, or will they just go crawl away into a hole and hide? And in ending his gospel this way, in some ways it invites us into the story. It leaves us with the question, how are we going to respond? Will we respond and live our lives in such a way as though the resurrection is true, or will we let grief, confusion, and fear rule our lives? But will we go out and tell the world, no, there is nothing to fear. Because Jesus has raised from the dead, everything is going to be okay. Will we live into that reality? Or will we let fear win the day and bury us in the ground? So Mark finishes his gospel in a way that perhaps invites you in and asks the question, what what is the grief you're experiencing? What is the confusion that besets you? What is the fear that's crawling all over you? And will you go out from that and say, I don't have to let that rule the day because Jesus has raised from the dead. So may you see that in the resurrection, a new day has dawned. May you trust that Jesus' words are sure 
and will come to pass. And as he says he's going to return and make all things new, he will do that. May you trust that Jesus has defeated death and conquered the grave. And may you go and live as though it's true. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the reality of the resurrection and what that means for our lives. It's so easy to take this day for granted. It's so easy to go through the motions and get dressed up and have Easter egg hunts and have nice brunches, all the while forgetting that what we are saying is that life has been forever changed. And so, Lord, today, we are people who have hope. Today, we are people who see beyond death to know that another world is coming that is marked by new creation. And so we put our hope in that. And so, Lord, help us to be people who have comfort in the face of grief, who have courage in the face of fear, and clarity in the face of chaos and confusion, that we might live a different sort of life to bear witness to who you are. We pray this in your name. Amen. We invite you to stand.